All right, so this is The Earth and Its Peoples by Richard Bullitt. We've got chapter 26, section 4, Imperialism in Latin America. So Latin America, uh, we're mostly referring to South and Central America. Uh, imperialism in Latin America was a little bit different in that most of it was what we might call indirect, whereas in other parts of the world, we saw, for example, how Great Britain just sort of outright took over India. Many European nations outright took over political institutions in Africa. In, in, in Latin America, many nations retain their independence, but are still influenced by outside powers, namely the United States. Uh, so again, just to bring back one major conflict that sort of changed the power dynamic in Latin America was the Spanish-American War. This was fought in 1898. Oops. 1898. And this was fought between the U.S. and Spain. And the victor in this conflict was the United States, which gave them more influence in Latin America. As a result of it, Spain lost their possessions in Latin America, including Cuba. Uh, Cuba became an independent nation. The United States did not outright take over that one, but Puerto Rico did become a U.S. territory. So in the case of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico did not retain its independence. It's a, an exception to this indirect um, kind of uh, theme going on in Latin America. Like I mentioned before, indirect, we could also refer this as economic imperialism. And that is the fact that outside countries can really reap the benefits economically. So for example, agriculture and minerals, so silver, gold, tin, copper, uh, Latin America uh, could produce a lot of this, right? So we'll just say about agriculture and minerals, we'll say Latin American exports. And so if countries like the United States, Britain, or France could benefit from agriculture coming from Latin America, from minerals coming from Latin America, there was no need to necessarily overthrow government, so they didn't. However, in order to extract those resources, infrastructure was required. Infrastructure would be things like railroads, right, to transport everything, uh, telegraphs in order to communicate, it might mean building things like ports in order for ships to dock. It could be roads. Uh, and so therefore, most of the infrastructure in Latin America was uh, not only technology that was brought from the outside, but also was outside investors. So for example, the US and the British in particular invested and built uh, much of Latin American Uh, infrastructure. So it wouldn't be uncommon, for example, for a U.S. company to own something like 70% of the railroad industry in Mexico. And this was true for a lot of other countries as well. Now, uh, these foreign investments essentially were allowed because they benefited the political elite. So we might say Latin American Elites welcomed, uh, we'll say foreign investment, F-O-R-E-I-G-N investment, because the political elites could still profit from it. It was largely the uh, rest of the population in Latin America that didn't benefit directly from uh, foreign, in, foreign, uh, foreign investments. And so this caused in one area in particular, Mexico, this was one of the contributing factors to a lot of political instability in the region. So uh, looking at the Mexican Revolution in particular as an event. Uh, now, one thing to kind of keep in mind was that Mexico at the time was led by General Perifero Diaz. He was essentially, we'll, we'll just call him the military ruler of Mexico. Uh, and he was certainly a, what we'd call a political elite. And so all the things that we talked about previously, the fact that there were uh, many foreign investments, right? Foreign owners, or sorry, foreign investors. This benefited Diaz and his regime. He was also very favorable towards 
hacienda owners. Uh, a hacienda is a, a plot of land. And in Mexico in particular, but other parts of Latin America, you know, the social system was set up so that there were Creoles, Mestizos, and uh, Native Americans or Indians. And for the most part, when we're talking about hacienda owners, we're referring to the Creole class, that is those who are born of European ancestry. So for Diaz, even though the slogan under his regime was liberty, order, and progress, really the people who are reaping all the benefits are that Creole class that owns plots of land. It's the foreign investors and foreign businesses. Uh, and it's really some of these other classes like the Mestizos and like the Indians who are being left out. Additionally, under Diaz, which ruled, I think he ruled from like 1875 to 1910. So Diaz ruled for a very long time uh, in Mexico. Uh, but Diaz also embraced foreign culture, you know, outside culture, European culture. In some ways, you might say that he rejected Mexican culture which of course did not play well with the uh, large Mexican population there. So Diaz was, you know, especially during the end of his regime, he had made many enemies, whether those were people who supported Mexican culture, whether those were people from the Mestizo or the Indian class, or they could just be uh, other people who resent the fact that foreign investors control so much of uh, the Mexican economy. And so uh, in 1910, one of Diaz's challengers, Francisco Madero, took uh, control of Diaz. Diaz was defeated in an election, and this was the beginning of the Mexican Revolution, which for the most part, we can just say, you know, this was years or a decade of political instability. Now, we're not going to go kind of through all the ins and outs of it, of it but just to kind of give you an idea of uh, how politically uh, uh, chaotic it was. Francisco Madero, he came to power in 1910, but was quickly disposed by Victoriano Huerta in 1913. In fact, Madero himself was assassinated. Right, and we'll see that's a common theme here. Uh, Huerta at first was U.S. backed, so he was supported by the United States. But when he came to power, that set off a series of revolts throughout um, Mexico, including opposition leaders like Carranza and uh, Obregón. I think I got that right. Obregón, uh, Emilio Zabata, Francisco Pancho Villa all led revolts uh, in various parts of Mexico, mostly in opposition to Huerta. Uh, the United States, fearing the sort of political instabil instability, fearing uh, U.S. interests might be a threat, invaded the port city of Veracruz in 19, I believe, actually, I don't know the exact year that it was invaded. Um, but Veracruz, we'll say this is a Mexican port city. We'll say uh, U.S. invaded. Right. Uh, again, you can think of it as there are a certain number of U.S. citizens in Mexico. The United States has a lot of money invested in Mexico. And so the fact that the country is going through the midst of a revolution is the reason for why the U.S. sent in troops to protect certain economic interests. Uh, the occupation by the United States of Veracruz created a very strong anti-U.S. sentiment. And because Huerta had previously been uh, really U.S. backed and U.S. supported, Pretty much all of the opposition against the United States manifested against uh, Huerta himself. So Huerta was eventually dis uh, deposed. Uh, Carranza and Obregón took control in 1914, uh, but they were opposed by popular leaders. And the popular leaders were representing mostly these classes here. Uh, you know, uh, you know, amongst these Maderos, the Huertas, the Carranzas of the world, I mean, they're still sort of vying for the support of the political and economic elite. You know, these are individuals who are still kind of working in the interests of, you know, this sort of part of society here. The popular leaders, these are the people who are mainly speaking on behalf of the mestizos, of the Indians, the landless populations, 
So for example, Emilio Zabata and, and Francisco Pancho Villa uh, lead revolts against specifically those Hacienda owners. We can think of it as much more of a populist slant. And so both of them lead kind of local revolts. Uh, Fr Francisco Pancho Villa, in fact, even invades the US, uh, attacks a city in the United States state of New Mexico. This prompts the United States to respond General John Pershing, he is a U.S. general, invades Mexico. Again, remember, strong anti-U.S. sentiment in Mexico. So U.S. general invades uh, Mexico to capture Villa. Right, that was the idea. Again, another example of uh, U.S. interference. Uh, eventually, Carranza does take control of the Mexican government. In 1917, a new constitution is drafted. Uh, the constitution itself wants to address some of the problems of land reforms. Again, in that case, we're talking about mostly only Creoles owning uh, the hacienda or large plots of land. So this is an effort to try and include other classes of people in land ownership. Economic nationalism, which means essentially to kick out foreign investors uh, and even to uh, you know put certain constraints on the church you know the catholic church not just in mexico but in latin america was sort of unique in that many of the revolutions from you know the revolutionary era the american revolution french revolution um, you know were anti-religious but in latin america a lot of the revolutions embraced the church and in fact i would say this turned out to be probably rather unpopular with a lot of people. But again, the idea was to put certain constraints on the power of the church. Maybe land ownership would, would be a good example uh, of that. But, you know, even after 1917, there continued to still be a lot of political instability. Just to give you an idea, it, you know, in the years leading, you know, in the years during the Mexican Revolution and even afterwards, uh, so Francisco Madero assassinated, Emilio Zabata was assassinated, Francisco Pancho Villa was assassinated, Carranza was assassinated, and Obrejan was assassinated, right? So a lot of uh, chaos in the, the midst of this, um, you know, particular period. So, um, you know, that is, uh, again, kind of the point I would say about the Mexican Revolution is that, you know, there are certain rumblings of various uh, groups in Mexico who are looking to uh, improve their standing, but overall, this is a uh, you know this is a story really of political instability in the region and kind of the way that uh, outside powers uh, factor into that, like the United States. Uh, again, just sort of uh, in talking about American exercise or increase American control. In Latin America, recall that Cuba was made independent. However, the United States passed the Platt Amendment, which gave the U.S. the right to intervene in Cuba. So even though Cuba was technically independent, the United States still exercised a lot of control. This was true for a lot of Latin American nations, that they were technically independent countries, but on multiple occasions, the United States sent in you know, forces for their own interests, whether that was sending in troops to Cuba, uh, sending in troops again to capture Ponce Villa or to or protect the port city of Veracruz. This was true in other countries as well, like um, you know Haiti, for example, the Dominican Republic, the US also sent in forces. So. Uh, again, going along this theme of kind of an indirect form of imperialism. Uh, lastly, and maybe the most significant, significant contribution uh, the United States made to Latin America was the Panama Canal. So the Panama Canal was an effort to connect the Atlantic and Pacific. You know, we don't have a, uh, a map here, but maybe I can kind of create a crude one here. So when we look at Latin America, both the United States um, and South America, again, I'm not an artist, so don't hold it against me. Uh, we'll go look something like that. We got Baja, California here. Uh, we go up the coast. 
and uh, it just kind of looks like Canada up there, right? So uh, what the Panama Canal was, was a man-made river that would cut across this part of South America. Before, in order to go from, let's say, San Francisco to New York, one had to sail all the way around in order to get here. The Panama Canal was hopefully a way to kind of make this a much shorter path, right? And that's what the canal, canal is a man-made river. So it connected the Atlantic, this is the Atlantic over here, with the Pacific, which is over here. Other countries had attempted to build, build it before the United States, but failed. Uh, the United States wanted to uh, build the canal, but at the time, the uh, country which was in control of it, Colombia, rejected. So uh, the United States helped to, you might say, encourage a rebellion by a section of Colombia, which was Panama. And the Panamanian rebellion was the US, um, we won't say led, but maybe US backed effort for Panama, which was kind of like a state in Colombia, to break away from Colombia. And of course, the exchange was that if the United States supports Panama's decision to break away from Colombia, then Panama would allow the United States to build a canal. And essentially, Panama was successful in gaining their independence. And as a condition of that, they allowed the United States to build the canal. Uh, I think construction ended in 1914. And after that point, ships could freely travel from the Pacific to the Atlantic without having to go all the way around South America.